Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Well, good morning. For those of you who are guests today, my name is Trey Kelly. I'm the, I'm the pastor here. We've sort of been celebrating for the last few weeks, getting ready for something really cool in our church. Uh, in two weeks, uh, our church will turn 10 years old, which is crazy. Uh-huh. 10 years old. And um, so that's coming up. We're really excited about it. But for the last few weeks, we've sort of been reflecting because the dream God put in me and a few people to start this church started way more than 10 years ago. And the same God that put a dream in me, I believe, has put a dream in all of us. I believe the same God that wanted to use me to do something for him wants to use each and every one of us in this room to do something for him. Whether we believe in him or not, I believe God believes in us. And that God wants to use us to make things better. That's why you see all these cool shirts walking around, better because. That's why you see a a billboard that says better is possible. We're obsessed with better. And we're obsessed with better because we think all of us are obsessed with better. Most of us look at life and look to the future and assume or hope things are going to get better than they currently are. And for those of us who who believe in Jesus, those of us who, who would call him our Heavenly Father, we can trust in that hope because he truly does make things Better And for, for some of you, maybe many of you today, maybe, maybe you're new to our church and maybe you're even new to faith, I, I have to believe that part of the reason you're checking out faith, part of the reason you're checking out church, part of the reason you're checking out God is because something inside you tells you he just might make things better. Now, what that thing is, I don't know. But we've been dreaming for the last few weeks about what God might want to, be do, want to do to us and through us and in us to make our lives better, to make our families better, to make our neighborhoods better, to make our community better, to make our world better. We've been in this series that we've been calling A Dream for a Decade, and we are right in the middle of it. And so if today is your first day, thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to highly encourage you, when you're done today, why don't you go download our app? You can grab it right here, um, grab the Wellspring app. We put all our content up there, and that way you can go back and watch weeks one and two. This is week three of the series, because we have covered a lot in those first two weeks, and I want you to be able to, to catch up. But very quickly, here's the question we've been asking as a church. Here's the question we've been inviting every person in this room, every person watching online, every person around to to ask, because we think it's a great way to frame the future. We think it's a way to frame the future and and to ensure success in the future, to, to ensure things get better by asking it this way, by thinking about the future this way, by dreaming about what comes next in this way. God, what is your dream for the next decade of my life? Now, you're at church, so you shouldn't be surprised we're talking about God here. But that's what we are encouraging people to ask, and that's why we know better is possible. Better is possible when we invite God to participate with us, and that's what we've been talking about for the last few weeks. And specifically, we've been asking God to give us specific dreams, just like he gave me. He gave me a specific dream to move my family from Fort Worth, Texas, to Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, to start a church that he was going to use to reach people far from him. He gave me that very specific dream. And I believe that God can give each and every one of us as equally specific dreams for our friends and our family and our neighbors and our coworkers and maybe even our world. And it begins with asking that question. And we've been asking that question for a few weeks. And for some of you, I know you've asked the question and you've got so many different things and so many different answers. And so what we've tried to do over the last few weeks is help clarify what God might want to do in us, to us, and through us. What God might want to use us to do. We've been talking about this concept for the last few weeks, and it's a concept of divine dissatisfaction. See, I believe if God wants to use us to change something, he's going to give us a divine dissatisfaction with the way things are. Now, notice I say divine dissatisfaction. We've been talking about this for the, for the last few weeks. This series is not an invitation to complain about your life. This series is not an invitation to be dissatisfied with your spouse and look at them and say, my dream is for you to get better. It's not an invitation to look at your kids and say, my dream is for you to get better grades. Like, that's not what what God is going to try to do in us. God is always going to come to us. and He's going to start with us. 
But he's going to build a divine dissatisfaction. So what that means is he's going to point out areas in our life that we are no longer satisfied with because he's not in them. He's going to point out areas in our community, areas in our world, where we know with his help, things could get better. With, with his will and with his ways and with his love, and if we could inject Jesus into the situation, it will get better. And that's why we know that a divine dissatisfaction will always move us in a divine direction. It's always going to move us towards God and towards his ways. Last week, we also learned that not only will it move us in a divine direction, we learned that it'll move us toward a divine destination. That if God is truly going to give us a dream, he's going to give us a destination. And he's going to give us a path to achieve it. Last week, we called that a vision. That God will give us a vision for our future because we know vision turns a dream into a destination. Vision is the mechanism by which we achieve it. Vision is the plan. Vision is the process. Vision is the path. And I believe that if God wants to use you to do something great, he's going to start giving you some clarity on what that looks like. Last week we talked about vision validators. Questions that God will answer for us in our lives and in our hearts as we try to see what he wants us to do. And here are the three questions. Number one, is there a path to pursue? This thing I think God is driving inside of me, this, this thing God wants me to fix, well, is there a path I can pursue to fix it? And not only is there a path to pursue, am I positioned to pursue it? Am I ready to do this? Can I do this? Am I positioned to be able to take this step? And number three we learned last week, am I prepared to pursue it? And hopefully if you've been with the last weeks, you've been asking these questions and you've been, you've been evaluating your life and you've been trying to say, all right, God, what is it you want to do in me? What is it you want me, will want to use me to do? Because just like God did for me several years ago, over a decade when he moved me from Dallas to here to start this church. See, I know these are true. I know this process is true because I've experienced it in my life. I've lived it in my life, but I'm not teaching it to you because I've lived it. I'm not teaching it to you just because it's been my experience. I'm teaching it to you because it can be discovered in God's truth. I'm teaching it to you because these principles play out over and over and over in something we call the Bible, which is God's gift to us. It's his story of how he, more, how he moves and how he works in humanity. And specifically for those of you who have been here for the last few weeks, we've been studying a man named Nehemiah. Nehemiah had a dream. God turned that dream into a vision. And he accomplished that vision and accomplished the purposes he wanted to through Nehemiah. So we've been studying Nehemiah's story. Because as we study it and we learn the principles that we find there, we can apply them in our own lives. And last week we did study Nehemiah. We studied and learned that he had a path to pursue. See, Nehemiah had his heart broken over something. His hometown, the nation of Israel, uh, the, the capital nation of Israel, Jerusalem, was in trouble. And he wanted to go rebuild the wall. God put that dream inside of him. But God also, also positioned him to be able to do it because he was the king's cupbearer. He was actually able to go to, to the king and ask for help. And when he went and asked for help, he was prepared to ask for it because he knew exactly what he needed to do to rebuild that wall. Again, that is a very fast recap. If you weren't here last week or the week before, I highly encourage you to go back and watch it. Because we're going to pick up right there today. Because even though Nehemiah had a path to pursue and he saw the path, and you might have a path to pursue and you might see that path, even though Nehemiah felt like he was positioned to pursue it, and you may feel like you're positioned to pursue it, and even though Nehemiah thought he was prepared to pursue it, just like you might feel prepared to pursue it, Nehemiah discovered and embraced a crucial ingredient that I believe is vital for every single one of us in this room to be able to accomplish the purposes that God actually has for us. It's that third question, that am I prepared to pursue it? We can feel, feel prepared all we want, but until we embrace this external crucial ingredient, we can know that we're not truly prepared for what God wants us to do. And today I'd like to give you an opportunity not only to learn about that crucial step, but to take that crucial step.
So if you have your Bibles, why don't you join me in Nehemiah chapter 2. This is where we'll be, Nehemiah 2. If not, it's going to be up here on the screen. Um, if you were here last week, we, we watched Nehemiah have an encounter with the king. He asked for permission to go rebuild the wall. The king said yes. We're going to pick up right there. Nehemiah gets permission to go rebuild the wall. He's got permission to go accomplish the vision God has given for him, and he takes off because Nehemiah is a go-getter. He, he, he makes his way to Jerusalem, and the first thing he does is he goes out and he inspects the wall that God has given him the vision to rebuild. He needs to go assess the situation, and as he does, he discovers it is worse than he even thought. The wall is in tatters, it has been burned down, and it is, it is as, at this moment, when Nehemiah has everything he needs, when Nehemiah is about to begin executing what God's told him, it is at this moment that Nehemiah announces to us and embraces this crucial ingredient. For those of you who don't know, we're actually reading Nehemiah's journal. Nehemiah wrote the book of Nehemiah, and it's basically just his, his account of all this that happened in his life. And so, in Nehemiah chapter 2, starting in verse 16, you know, before 16, he tells us about going there and, and inspecting the wall, and then he sort of gives us a little aside, a little insight into his thinking. Here's what he says. He says, The city officials did not know I had been out there or what I was doing, for I had not yet said anything to anyone about my plans. See, he had great dreams. He had a vision, and he was prepared for it, and he was positioned for it, but he hadn't told anyone else about it. He hadn't even said the words out loud. Can anyone in the room relate to that? Oh, I've got this great idea from God, and I really think God wants me to do it, and I really think God has positioned me for it, and I think God has a path. Well, have you told anybody? Well, no. Why would I tell people? Well, because that's part of the process. See, Nehemiah hadn't told anyone yet. He hadn't invited anyone in. Who did he think was going to build this wall with him? See, Nehemiah had to take a step. Nehemiah had to share what was happening, and he had to, he had to invite other people in to the process. He had to invite other people in who shared his dream. He had to invite other people in who shared his passion for God. He had to invite other people in to help fully prepare him for what God wanted him to do. And I'll go ahead and tell you, spoiler alert, so do we. That's the step. But first, let's see how Nehemiah takes it. Here's what he tells us. He had said, I haven't told anybody, but now I said to them. He calls some of the, the leaders together. And he says, you know very well what trouble we are in. Notice he says we, even though he hadn't been there for the destruction of the wall. He doesn't walk into other people's problems and say, you people got a problem and I'm here to fix it. He comes in and he says, hey, we have a problem. We have a, we have a struggle. And he explains to them, Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire. Let us rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and end this disgrace. Guys, look around. We all see this. We all know this isn't good. Let us come together. Let us unite around purpose. Let us believe that God is who he said he is, that God can accomplish good, and let's rebuild this wall. And then he gives them a little background. He tells them this. He says, then I told them about how the gracious hand of God had been on me and about my conversation with the king. See, I believe at that point, Nehemiah recounts for them the story we've read for the last two weeks. And he talks about when he heard news of the wall, he cried. And as he cried, he prayed. And he begged his heavenly father to help him and to give him a picture and to give him a path to make it better. And he did. And he shares with them how God had given him favor with the king. And he's brought them to this moment. Nehemiah shares his dream. He shares his vision. He shares his passion. He shares his struggle. He shares his heartbreak. He shares this with other people. He shares this with God's people who have been prepared for this moment. He shares this with them. And then he says these words. Yes, I'm sorry, then they said these words. They responded back to him, and they said, let's rebuild the wall. So they began the good work. He tells them the story. He tells them all the things God has done, and he invites them to join them, and they say yes. 
They say, we will join your dream. We will join your vision. We will unite with you because we know that God. We know he wants good, and we want to see it happen. See, Nehemiah had a path, and Nehemiah was positioned, but he was not prepared until he surrounded himself with people. He was not prepared until other people came on board and united with him and said, yes, we will work together. And it's so critical for all of us in the room today, for all of us who want to pray that prayer, God, what do you want? God, what is your dream for the next decade of my life? It is so critical that we can see the path as clearly as we've ever seen it. We can feel as positioned and we can feel like we've done everything we can to be prepared. But if we are not a part of God's people, if we do not have people around us working with us, we will never be able to accomplish what it is that God wants to do through us. Because here was the truth Nehemiah understood. And here's the truth Nehemiah's story illustrates. And here's the truth that we all can choose to embrace today in our effort to discover whatever it is God wants to do in us, to us, and through us. And it's this. It's that God prepares us for his purpose through his people. He will always include his people. He will always include a community of faith in his preparation for what he wants to do. He will never call us to something and say, oh, by the way, you got to go alone. That's just not who our God is. That's not how he works, and it's certainly not how he's worked in my life. That's certainly not how he worked as we started Wellspring Church. I've told the story many times we were living in Fort Worth, Texas, a little suburb of Fort Worth called Keller, working at a church called Keystone Church, when God called us to move here, and when Keystone, when Wellspring began, when God called us, we had four people that attended our church, me and my wife, Danielle, and my two sons, who were two and a half and seven months at the time, David and John, so they didn't have a choice. <laughs> they were going to Wellspring. That was it. There were four of us. And immediately, God began to surround me with his people to prepare me for his purpose. Every time Wellspring's ever grown, every good thing that's ever come from Wellspring is because other people have joined in to the process. Uh, For those of you who don't know his name, T.J. Goff, that's our worship leader. He was a guy up here uh, singing in the middle. T.J. has been with us from day one. If you've been on Wellspring for a long time, you know that. But what you don't know is the story of how God brought us together. T.J. and I were in seminary together uh, in uh, Fort Worth, Texas. Uh, T.J. actually was in the band at Keystone when we started Keystone. Um, But pretty soon after that, he and his wife, Beth, felt called to the San Francisco Bay Area to to lead worship uh, out there. And so they moved away. And um, when God called us to move to Myrtle Beach to start a church, we had some mutual friends, and we still don't really know how it exactly happened, but somehow a mutual friend told TJ I wanted to hire him, even though I never said those words, because I didn't know who I wanted to hire yet. But it's what he heard, and so I was still living in Fort Worth at the time, and I was driving in the, on, the, on the monstrosity that is their eight-lane highway interstates, and I get a call from a number I don't recognize. I say hello, and it's TJ. And this is in early June, and we hadn't moved it to, to South Carolina yet. We had no idea what God wanted us to do. And he said, hey, how you doing? We talked for a minute. And basically, he's like, hey, I hear you're starting a church, and I hear there's a chance you might want me to come. Should we talk about that? I was not prepared for that conversation, positioned for that conversation, and there was no path for that conversation. And I'm like, what is happening? Uh, no, who told you this? What? I mean, you're a great dude, but no, nah, man, I'm not. I have no idea what I'm going to do. I haven't even moved yet. And then he says, well, here, here's what I'm calling. And I know you're not ready to have this conversation, but here's what I'm calling. Beth and I are about to buy a house. We got it under contract. We're about to close on it. And if there was any chance that this was going to happen, you know, we didn't really want to close on a house in San Francisco if we were going to be moving to Myrtle Beach shortly. So should I buy my house? And I'm like, bro, buy your house. Buy your house. 
I, I can't, I have no idea. So if that's what you're waiting on, buy it, baby, because I'm not ready to have this discussion. And so we talked about a few other things. Good luck. Have a nice life. And I hung up the phone. And that was it. Didn't think about TJ for months. We move here in mid-June, July, into August. We live with my dad for a little bit of the time. Then we find a house for, for, for us. We move into that house. We get settled. We get the kids back to school. And it's probably right around this time, actually. Um, Danielle and I are driving around one day. And just so you know, this is TJ's favorite part of the story. I look at her and I say, I can't get TJ Goff out of my mind. <laughs> he loves that part. But I couldn't. I, I was just like, I, was like I, I can't stop thinking about TJ. And she looks at me and she says, well, you know, they still haven't closed on their house. And I was like, what? She goes, yeah, it's been months and they keep getting all these little weird things. They don't know what's going on. They still haven't closed on their house. And I was like, I know what's going on. I went home and immediately emailed TJ. And I said, buddy, I'm sorry I wasn't ready before, but I wasn't, but I am now. I hear you haven't closed on your house. I think we should talk. I think you might be the guy. What, uh, what, what do you think? He emailed back almost immediately, or either he called me. Two months later, he was here. And that was how God doubled the size of our church. <laughs> doubled the size, baby, from four to eight in two months. They put us on the cover of a magazine, man. But, but, but it was that sharing a dream, inviting someone in that helped Wellspring grow. Well, that and the fact that we were married to Danielle and Beth, and they actually invited people and were nice and connected to people. And me and TJ just sat in the back and were like, hi, it was good to see y'all. So thank God for Beth and for Danielle, because they invited everyone in the world. But that's what God began to do. So, and then God began to bring other volunteers and other people who were committed, other people who would gather around us and say, okay, yes, we want to do this. And, and it was in that, that talking and that sharing with them that God continued to prepare me for his purpose to where eventually we were able to, to launch weekly gatherings in September of 2009 and then sustain those gatherings. And we did that for about a year. And then God brought another person to us to prepare us for what he wanted to do. And this person, many of you know, is our student pastor now. His name's Eric Colquitt. And Eric and I also have known each other since seminary. Uh, he was actually on staff with me at Keystone Church. And when God called Danielle and I to move to Myrtle Beach, Eric didn't make eye contact with me for a month. He, every time I'd see him, he's like, I'm not talking to you. I'm not talking to you. I, it was, I mean, he, we were joking. And, but ever, when we moved here and God really began to burst some stuff, I, I was just convinced Eric was going to join our team. And uh, we would actually have some staff meetings at my house, in my den. And it'd be me and Danielle and TJ. And I would say things like, well, when Eric gets here, that's what he'll do. And, and TJ and Danielle honestly had like an intervention planned because they thought I was losing my mind. But about a year into the launch, Eric and I, we would talk on the phone all the time. And we were talking one day about Keystone and about Wellspring and chatting. And we hung up the phone. And, and I would say within 30 seconds to one minute of hanging up the phone, I got a text from Eric. And I have to tell you exactly what it says. It said, oh, by the way, I still haven't said no to praying about Wellspring. That's all it said. I haven't, not I haven't said no to Wellspring. I haven't said no to praying about Wellspring. I looked at Danny, I said, we got him. We got him. And about three months later, he and April moved, which we had no, at the time, April uh, wasn't in ministry. She was, she was doing her stuff. We had no idea what God was going to bring in that situation, but, but he did. And, and every single time Wellspring has grown, it has been because other people partner with our dream, partner with our mission, partner with our, our vision. And that's still true to this day. We grow because people choose to invite, and because people choose to invest, and because people choose to partner. But I don't think that just works for my dream. I think that works for all dreams. I think all dreams that God wants to give us need a place where you can feel safe 
and where you can share your heart and where you can be encouraged and where you can be equipped and where you can be prepared. And in fact, as the pastor of this church, one of the greatest responsibilities I have and the thing we take so seriously is what we are doing as a church to prepare you for what God might want to do in you, to you, and through you, to prepare you with a group, to prepare you for the next step that you have, to teach you, to encourage you, to to say over and over and over and over again, you can't do this alone. We don't pursue God's dreams alone. Jesus didn't pursue God's dreams alone. For those of you who know the story, The first thing Jesus did when he launched his three-year ministry to change the world, before he began healing, before he began preaching, before he began encouraging, before he began teaching, he recruited a group. He recruited a team of 12 men to walk with him, to support him, to be with him in the process. And I believe that was a picture for us. And as your church, we are passionate about doing things that prepare you and equip you for what God wants you to do. It's why the thing we work harder on than anything else is planning what we're going to talk about in this room. It's why we kicked off the fall with a series on dreams. But see, we meet as a team um, all the time, but once a year we go away together. I go away first and I pray, and then we go away as a team and we pray and we plan and we prepare. And like currently we know everything we're going to talk about through the end of May of next year. Because we've prayed about it, and and we've heard from God. And what I get really excited about is I can't wait to see what God's going to use, that we're going to talk about, how he's going to use it to prepare you for what he wants you to do. Because I don't know what he wants to use it for. I just know what he told us to talk about. But I know every time we talk about something, and every time we teach something, God uses it to prepare someone for something, to take a step. For example, here's where we're going for the next fall. And I don't know what this is going to stir up inside of your heart, but I bet it's going to stir up something in some of your hearts to know you're not alone in this, that God is at work and God is going to continue to prepare you for his purposes through his people, through this place. See, after 10 years, the first series we're going to do this fall is a series that I believe is going to be the most helpful, the most practical, the most life-changing series we've ever done because it's a series on how we communicate with each other how we speak to each other, how we hear from each other. And I know you hear that and you think, oh, communication, what does that have to do with anything? And then you think about it. Think about the last 10 fights you had with anybody you fight with. Eight of them were miscommunication fights. And the other two would have been shorter if you could communicate better. There is literally no area of our life that won't get better when we invite Jesus into our communication. We will become better leaders. We will become better followers. We will become better spouses. We will become better parents. We will become better children, better bosses, better employees. And so as a church, we are going to spend some time inviting Jesus into our communication to see if he could help make it better. Doesn't that sound like a purpose worth pursuing? We're then going to spend some time as as a church asking the question the church has asked for 2,000 years. As a people who have a certain belief system, as a people who have a faith, as a people who, who believes that following God is best, how do we interact with a world that disagrees with us? And specifically, how do we live in such a way where we can change their minds? How can we convince them that we are right? How can we convince them that life really is better because Jesus isn't it? That's what we're going to talk about. And then we're going to come to a series, and when I say it, you're all going to go, well, I'm going to miss that one. We're going to come to a series on money management. And I know when I say that, you're like, well, that sounds like giving. But it's not a giving series. Here's the, here's the realization I've come to as the pastor of this church. Most people want to be generous. Most people want to give money away. Most people want to use their resources to help the world. The problem isn't the want to, the problem is the know-how. And so we're going to spend two weeks talking purely about money management. You know what the title of the series is? You need a budget. That's the title of the series. You need a budget, and 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 you need a budget. We're just going to spend two weeks, because you wouldn't wouldn't believe this, but God actually gives us principles for this. God wants us to be good stewards. And we're going to spend two weeks just really simplifying, okay, 
How do we create a budget? How do we pay bills? How do we live a life of margin? And what we believe, if we, if, if we uh, apply these biblical principles to our life, we will find at the end of each month, there will be more extra than there was before. That's the promise of the series. What you do with the extra is completely up to you. But I'm just convinced that we can apply God's truth even to that area of our lives, and it will be better. See, that's our job as your church. Our job as your church is to hear from God and to hear these big sweeping themes that he wants to talk about for, for seasons and to invite you in so that he can, he can change this little heart area of your heart and this little area of your heart and prepare you for this little next thing and prepare you for this, this, this other little next thing. Like, like It's the glory of what we get to do. I don't know what God's birthing in you. I don't know what God's got prepared for you, but I know we will be a part of that process. And I know it won't even stop in this room. See, one of our core values as a church, something we talk about a lot, a, lot of, a lot here, is that we believe circles are better than rows. See, you're sitting right now in rows, and we love rows. Rows are great. We really do. We, we enjoy rows. For those of you who may not have noticed in the 10 o'clock service, we have actually added new rows in our effort to make room to grow. We added new rows, and they're almost full already, so I don't know what we're going to do. Please come to the 830 or the 1130. They're both exactly the same. You can just come to one of those. But we believe circles are better than rows because what I experienced in my life as we were beginning Wellspring, TJ and I didn't launch this church because we sat in a room together. We were able to launch this church because we shared our dreams, because we had conversations. See, one of the blessings of a church this size is that we can pull our resources to do great things for the community. We can have amazing environments for our kids. It's great. One of the curses of a church this size is it's very easy to come in, stay invisible, and leave. And never make a connection. To never feel like you have a community. To never feel like you have a family here. And see, what I believe Nehemiah would teach us and what I believe Jesus would teach us and what I, what I know I've experienced is if I truly want to be prepared for the purposes that God has for me, if I truly want to be a part of his community and be a part of his people, it's got to get bigger than just a place where I come and I sit. I need a community where I can share. I need a community where I can share my dreams, where I can talk about the struggles I'm having. I need a community that shares the dreams I have. Now, it may not be the specific dream for what I want to happen in my neighborhood or my community, but it is the dream that Jesus makes things better. I believe every one of us in this room deserves a small community of believers that can surround us, that loves us, that wants to support us, and that believes with all their heart that Jesus can make things better. Can you truly say your life wouldn't be better if you had that? I know mine is. For about four or five years now, I've been, reading, I've been meeting with a group. It's four other men. We meet every other week. I'm the only pastor in the group. Thank goodness. <laughs> and we share our dreams with each other. We believe Jesus can make things better. And the things I've seen God prepare us for in that group are more than I could ask or imagine. God has prepared us for tragedy. God has prepared us for trial and turned it into triumph. We have seen men lose jobs in a day. And we've seen God do more than we can imagine on the other side. We've seen God in this group lead these men to dream for a decade and to take life-altering leaps of faith that not only changed their life but changed the lives of other people. We've seen God in this group lead us into how to navigate mistakes. We've seen God in this group lead us how to navigate amazing success. More success than they ever thought possible. But what we all know is everything we've achieved now and everything God's done, we would all point back and say he has used that group and those men to prepare us for his purpose. And we want the same thing for you. As your church, we want to partner with God to prepare you for whatever it is he wants to use you to do in the world. We want to partner with God to prepare you for that dream 
that is going to turn into a vision that's going to become your destination. We want to partner with him. We want to prepare you because we are convinced. And our prayer today is that you will become convinced of this truth, that God prepares us for his purpose through his people. So the question today is very simple. The question isn't, do you have a dream? The question isn't, do you see a path? The question is, are you prepared to pursue it? Do you have God's people in your life? And I don't mean just the church. We love that you attend our church. It's an amazing church. And I am convinced there is a small group of people within this church that God wants to use to prepare you for his purpose. So are you prepared? Do you have a small group of people that you share your heart with, that you share your struggles with, that can celebrate with you, that are united around Jesus, and that God's using to propel you toward what he wants? If the answer is yes, fantastic. Keep it up. Because God's still preparing you for more. If the answer is no, As your church, we are prepared today to help you turn that no into a yes. We want to help you find your circle. We want to help you find your group. We want to help you find your people that God's going to use to prepare you for his purposes. And it's very simple. You have to let us know you need a group, and you can do that in two ways. Number one is back to the app. If you have the app or if you want to download the app right now, I think the very top link on the app is sign up for a group. Fill it out. Give us some information. We'll contact you this week, and we'll pair you with a group of people. When we dismiss today, you can go to our Blue Room if you want to have a conversation with some folks. But look, I know that this is a tough one for many people. I know this is a sticking point, and that's why I've tried to tell you so many stories. And it's why we've tried to look at Nehemiah, and it's why we've tried to look at Jesus. Jesus himself needed a group. So do you. So do I. And as your church, it's our job to provide it. And we are prepared. Are you? Are you prepared for God to mold you and to shape you and encourage you and to equip you for the next decade of your life. Because see, I believe the next decade is going to be a more than I can ask or imagine decade. I believe the next decade is going to be a better because decade. A decade of just discovering over and over and over again how life is better because of Jesus. And part of God's preparation for you is a small, safe place that you can share your heart and you can trust they're going to unite around you and remind you that life really is better because Jesus is in it. So if you don't currently have that, if that's not something, that if, if names aren't popping to your mind immediately, take a step today. Prepare today. Position yourself today. Walk this path today and trust that our Heavenly Father who's always dreaming will use this step and will use these people to prepare you to do infinitely more than you could ask or imagine. Let me pray. Father, we love you so much. God, we thank you for your son, and we thank you that you modeled for us community, that you modeled for us a group. And I pray that we will take that to heart. God, I pray you will give us the courage today to take a step to be prepared, take a step on our path towards you, take a step to be positioned where you want us to be. God, as the as the dreams in our hearts become visions that we want to accomplish, may we not miss this critical piece that you prepare us for our purposes through your people. May we step towards your people. And may we step towards being prepared for whatever it is you want to do. We love you. 
It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.